Good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone. It's good to be back here. Uh, our church has opened again, and we welcome you all, uh, those who have uh, joined us this morning. And we also invite those that are still at home. Uh, we are happy to inform you that um, our church has opened our doors to up to 25% capacity. So we are happy that uh, God has given us this opportunity this morning. Uh, before we start our praise and meditation, I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles with you to the book of Psalm, chapter 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. As my wife would uh, play uh, the song, This is my father's soul, I'd like you all to uh, also put your minds into this verse and that how God is in control of all these things. Let's bow our heads for prayer. The great God in heaven, the Lord, rejoice in our heart. We are happy to be here to praise you and, and get to know more of you. Father, we ask for your spirit to be with us, to guide each one of us here, especially our pastor as he prepares to give us the message that you have for us. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful Sabbath day and for your love and your grace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I'm so happy to see all of you here. Well, it's just a few of us for now, but it's just the beginning of more people that we'll be having at our church since we are now open. Praise God. Amen, amen. 
So a few announcements that we have. Uh, we have opened our church. So come join us at our church. We are open. We open our arms wide open and welcome you to come to our church. So please come join us. Now, uh, first reading for transfer. Uh, Jonathan Go uh, from Oceanside SDA Church to San Diego Central SDA Church. Jonathan Go has been joining our church in our Bible study, our Sabbath school Bible study, and also our uh, morning prayer group. He's been joining us. He lives up in Escondido, and he's been coming to our church, uh, joining us live stream. So uh, he has transferred his membership to our church, and board has approved it. So he will be joining our church. That was the first reading. Okay, and passing away. So we have quite a few people that have passed away. First, Fiona Frank's mother in Kenya passed away. And that was just, uh, she flew out last uh, Sunday, I believe, flew out to Kenya. So please keep her family in your prayer. And also Carla Rivas' uh, aunt passed away. And she flew to El Salvador and she came back just a couple of days ago. Uh, she was her, like, like her mother to her, and it was, we were so sad to hear that uh, her mother, uh, her aunt passed away. So please keep her f uh, family in your prayer. Eric Avahar, uh, I don't know him, but uh, apparently many of you know him. He's young, but he passed away from uh, cancer, battling cancer, just last week. So please keep his family in your prayer as well. Okay, and Supreme Court ruling, as you know, uh, Supreme, Court, uh, Supreme Court has ruled that church indoor service can be open up to 25% in, in the purple tier as well. So as a result, we have opened our church for the first time um, after many, many months of closing our church. So we, yes, praise God, and I'm so glad that we could do that. And we are opening our church, so please come join us. And we are continuing on our live stream as well, so please join us. Either you are at home or are here at church um, building as well. And uh, 2020 uh, donation receipts have receipts have been mailed out to you, so you should have received it a long time ago. Uh, thanks to Bonnie for doing so and mailing uh, each and every one of them out. Some of them have been returned to us, so I contacted some of you to uh, correct the address or something. But if you have any questions or if you have not received your receipt yet, please contact me and I'll make sure that you get your receipt so you can file your taxes. Okay, and uh, there will be a memorial service for many crews today at 2 p.m. here at church in the chapel. But that service is uh, a private service for the family only. So um, the family will be here soon and they'll be um, having their memorial service here at 2 p.m. Please pray for the family. And since we cannot attend the service, uh, we can't attend it, but you will pray for them. And uh, a video or a, a photo slideshow and the video clip of the family will be available for us to watch online um, after the service, like so maybe sometime this week or maybe next week will be available. So please keep their family in your prayer as well. And Love Month special, so fellowship special will be on March 13th at 6 p.m. There will be a Zoom event. The, so the fellowship uh, ministry has prepared an event for us to get together and to see each other and to uh, have fellowship together. So that will be, mark your calendar, March 13th at 6 p.m. There will be a KMEM joint worship at the beginning. So the sundown worship will be together, it will be translated. After the worship, we will split up. So the KM will go and meet with their, on their own, and EM will meet on our own to have separate fellowship. And the fellowship ministry has requested for you to bring a photo that will give you a good memory during this, I guess during this time of pandemic, something that uh, has a special memory. Uh, so bring, uh, prepare a photo to share with everyone for that day. Okay, that's all the announcement there is. So let's go into worship now.
Our gracious and loving Father, we thank you for bringing us safely through another week. We thank you for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us for the ups and downs that has helped to develop and strengthen our characters. Lord, we come before you today to give you thanks, to give you praise, to give you glory and honor, recognizing you as the creator because of the Sabbath day, this day that you specifically made for us. And we come together to fellowship wherever we are. And as we come together, dear Lord, there are also concerns that we have. You know, you know the losses that we have suffered in the past two weeks. We ask that you be with the families. Be a comfort to them. Strengthen them. Give them hope, dear Lord. Help them to remain steadfast and strong. We want to pray also for the young people, that you would be with them, that you would bless them, dear Lord, that they would rekindle that fire in their minds and in their hearts to know more about you and to draw closer to you. Be with the elderly especially too, dear Lord. Comfort them in their afflictions that are usually concomitant with growing old and weak. We ask you to be close to them. Help them, dear Lord, to strengthen and rely and trust in your word and in the fellowship of the church. We ask that you be with the pastor as he come to minister before your people. Fill him with your Holy Spirit and let the words be words of encouragement to us. This we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Sabbath everyone. Today's scripture reading can be found in Matthew 6 verse 9 through 13. And it says, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever, forever and ever. And ever. Amen. Amen. Isn't that adorable and beautiful to see the family doing the scripture reading together? Yes, amen. <clears throat> I know it's been 50 weeks uh, since, we, since the first lockdown on March 14 of 2020. 50 weeks, and today is the 51st week. It's been the full year shy of one week. 52 years in a, in a year. So it has been exactly a year minus one, one week. And we are praising God that we can open our church and welcome you. And I'm so happy to see all of your faces. <laughs> so praise God. I know you've been doing okay. And I talked to some of you and maybe some of you a while ago. But um, I'm just happy that you are here today. And I would like to welcome everyone joining us on live stream as well. So welcome to our church and welcome to our worship service today. And we've been studying the Lord's Prayer and today is the last day of the series of the Lord's Prayer. And we are reading that part or studying that part for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This part of the Lord's Prayer is called doxology. And the word Doxology is a familiar word for many of us because the word doxology is actually um, 
a Greek word that we know, right? So this is what it says. Doxologia is the Greek word that we get the word doxology from. And the Greek word combination is this. Doxa in Greek means glory. And logia in Greek means saying. So it's the word like the logos, the word logos, or the Bible, logos, is the same as the word or saying. So those two words combined, doxa and logia, is doxa logia. It's the English, the, the root word of the word uh, doxology in, in uh, English. So what that means is this. According to Webster's Dictionary, it says, a hymn expressing praise and honor to God, a form of praise to God, designed to be sung or chanted by the choir or the congregation. So we don't practice that as much, but in the olden days, after the, uh, there is a reading of the Word of God, that everyone will either stand and they would chant or sing a short phrase, um, praising God, giving glory to God. That's what it means. And there are, the Bible is full of those examples of, of doxology in the Old Testament and both in New Testament. There are so many of them. And that's what that is, doxology. Okay? So that's what we are studying this part at the end of the Lord's Prayer. Now, open your Bibles um, to Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. Matthew chapter 6, verse 13, and tell me what your Bible says. Does your Bible say, 6.13, it says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Does your Bible end there, or does it have doxology with it? How many of your Bibles ends after lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil? How many of your Bibles ends there? None of you? So all of your Bibles also say, where thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, all your Bibles say that? Okay. Okay, good, good, good. Because some of the Bibles have that part, but some of the Bibles omit that part. Let me tell you what's going on there. So um, there are various Bible versions that have that part, doxology, included in the Bible, and there are some of the Bible versions that do not have that part, this part. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And amen. So why is it that with some Bible versions will include that and some Bible versions will not include that? Why is it? So we want to study that part and what it means. Okay? So here is what it says. King James Version, which was first printed in 1611, says, And lead us not into temptation. This is Matthew 6.13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And New American Standard Bible, which was first printed in 1995, says, and same thing. It has the doxology included in it. And an Amplified Bible, first printed in 1987, also has this included. But, as you can see, this is included in parentheses. Okay? So those three, and this is by far, it's not all. It's just a few examples of some versions that include this part as part of Matthew chapter 6, 13. However, if you go to some other versions, like uh, English Standard Version, printed in 2002, says, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And that's the end. And in New International Version, printed in 1973, says the same thing. Deliver us from the evil one. And it ends there. It's because evil and the evil one, that if you look at the Greek word, the word can be, you know how some, the Greek has masculine and feminine word, and there's a neuter word that can also describe as masculine or an object, but not feminine. That word evil is neuter. So that could apply as Satan, as, as masculine, or neuter as evil deeds. Or that's why it's evil or evil one. <clears throat> and also, uh, International Standard Version, printed in 2011, says, and again, that does not have the doxology included in it. 
So it's so confusing. Why do we have some versions including this part, some versions not including some part? Um, so what's, what's the catch? What's the problem? What's the, what's the problem here? Why are they different? And this part, if you know, <clears throat> if you know the, the Lord's Prayer song, this is the climax, right? You know, like, um, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. That's, that's the climax. Why is this not included in some Bible? Right? And some people may say, well, this is not fair and this is not good. Now, this is what we need to study and this is what we need to know. We need to know what TR means. So TR, textus receptus. So that's also a Greek word. Textus receptus means received text. And TR, I'll be using, we're calling it TR, Textus Receptus. That means everybody can now receive the text. That's what that means. That, that's the meaning of the Textus Receptus. So, Textus Receptus, TR, is the Greek text put together by Erasmus in 1516 from the 6th six late Greek manuscripts from the 12th century to the 15th century. And this became the foundation for all English versions, including King James Version, until 1881, when the English Revised Version was published. So, again, TR is the six Greek manuscripts Erasmus put together from the Greek text, and that became the base of the new or the English translations of the Bible that was used from 1611 or 15 something before King James Version all the way to 1881 when the new uh, English Revised Version came out. And this is the key point six manuscripts were the basis of TR. Okay? And uh, that was known to be the most authoritative Bible uh, Greek manuscripts that they, they were around at that time. And at that time, by the time King James Version was translated, which is 1611, there were around 25 Greek manuscripts known, and six were chosen to be used out of 25. Today, do you know how many manuscripts are there? Greek manuscripts. 5,800 manuscripts of full and partial. And some are just small, tiny pieces, small, tiny pieces that only include like two words or three words. So there are a lot of fragments, but today there are over 5,800 manuscripts compared to only 25 in about 15th century. That is the difference. So, um, you heard about the Dead Sea Scroll? Dead Sea Scroll. So um, they discovered the Dead Sea Scroll in 1946 to 1956. There were so many different scrolls within that area. The first discovery was 1946 and 1947, but throughout the whole 10 years, they discovered more and more around that area. So those are called the Dead Sea Scroll. And Dead Sea Scroll we know as to be one of the most um, uh, inclusive and had really well preserved the Word of God. So, this scroll was found, discovered in 1946. So, that was that included in TR or not? No. TR was, was uh, made in the 15th century, like before uh, the King James Version was printed, which is 1611. So, so what is the key point? What am I saying here? So if you know Textus Receptus that Erasmus gathered, at that time, people could not read the Bible in English. If you were to read the Bible, you had to learn to speak either Greek or Hebrew or Latin that people did not speak. So a lot of people didn't really know how to read the Bible. The only thing they could do is they'd go to, go to church or go to a Catholic church, and the priests will read and interpret the Bible from Latin 
or Greek or Hebrews or sometimes German. And people who do, who do not speak those languages, they couldn't read the Bible to themselves, for themselves. So Erasmus said, you know what? Let's put together the manuscripts and let's make it available for people to read. And if you know something about history, 1611, when King James Version came out, that's when all the English literature just exploded. Right? So that's what happened. People started reading. They didn't have a lot of uh, Bibles available. And printing was available around that time as well. So King James from England, he actually authorized this Bible. Actually, he did that to make money because that was the most popular Bible and people wanted to buy them. And he said, you know what? I think I can make money out of this. And that's why he authorized it. But however, God used that opportunity to spread the word of God. And King James Version became the most famous Bible even today. People consider it is the most authoritative Bible. But as I shared this Bible um, series a couple of years ago, when the first time King James Version was released, people criticized King James Version Bible and did not accept the Bible so long because it has so many errors inside. Errors meaning not, not divine errors, or human errors. They misprinted words here and there, and there are so many, like over 2,000 errors inside the Bible, and they had to revise it so many times. However, that's what happened. So the King James Version Bible and the older translations before 1881 were based on TR. Okay? Now, after TR, so, and here is a picture of uh, a TR. So, Textus Receptus is, is this. So, these two pictures are the pictures of Textus Receptus. Now, after that, um, what happens is this. And people have, or there have been new um, manuscripts that have been discovered ever since that time, after TR had been produced. The first, actually, this one also. First one that they have discovered is Codex Vaticanus, which is dated from AD 325 to 350, discovered in the 15th century, and it is now located in the Vatican Library in Rome. And it contains nearly all the Bible and considered to be the most trustworthy Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. So, why is this considered the most trustworthy? It is because the earliest manuscript possible that, that we have available of the New Testament. 325. Some consider it as from 300. So, what well, Greek New Testament... Uh, was written around uh, 100 AD. That's like 70 AD to 100 AD. So then for about 200 years, why are there no manuscripts? The manuscripts written around that time are all lost, or we haven't found them yet. So the earliest manuscript that we have available of the New Testament is Codex Vaticanus from 325 to 350. And that one was discovered in 15th century after TR was produced. And here are some pictures. Do you think you can read the letters here? I mean, if you speak Greek, yeah, I mean, is, is this legible? Yes, very, very clear. And remember, this was written in 325 AD. So that's like close to 2,000 years ago and still well-preserved like this. That's how carefully they preserve the manuscripts. And again, this is a writing. So that, that's how they wrote Greek. So because we don't speak Greek, they're all like, what is this? You know, this is all gibberish to us. I studied Greek, but still, when I look at it, like, well, I mean, yes, I can read it, but... Um, my Greek, my score for Greek wasn't that good. <laughs> and I forgot a lot about Greek. But I can still read this Greek because this is so clear after about 2,000 years. So this is um, Codex Vaticanus. Now, after the Codex Vaticanus, the second most authoritative manuscript is called Codex Sinaiticus, which is dated from 350 which was discovered in 1844 at the monastery of a Saint Catherine at the foot of Mount Sinai in Israel. That's why, hence the name Codex Sinaiticus, because it was found near Mount Sinai. 
and it contains all of the New Testament and half of the Old Testament manuscript, considered to be the second most reliable because now this dating is later than the Codex Vaticanus. Codex Vaticanus was from 300 or 325, whereas this one is 350. So there are, it's almost identical except for few parts, some parts that are not the same. But again, this is considered the second most authoritative writings. Okay, so my point is that when you look at the later discoveries, I told you 25 manuscripts and then 5,080 uh, manuscripts. They, there have been so many more discoveries of New Testament manuscripts. Now, when they found new manuscripts, that doesn't mean they are later. They are closer, they are older manuscripts, they are closer to original. So, TR, Textus Receptus, which was um, from 12th century to the 15th century, now these two, Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus, they predate them so much more, more than a thousand years. You get the idea? TR was the manuscripts based on the 12th century to the 15th century, whereas in Codex Sinaiticus from 325, Codex, Codex Vaticanus, and then Codex Sinaiticus from 80, 350. So about 1,000 few hundred years prior to the TR. So is there any difference between TR and these newer manuscripts that they've discovered? Or the older, I should say. What is the difference? There are lots and lots of differences. I mean, I shouldn't say a lot, but there are some differences. If you look at the key, in, key important things of the Bible text, it is the same. 99% is the same. But the differences are the minor differences of spelling differences. Or some verses added. You hardly ever find anything that is taken out from from the later on manuscripts, meaning when there is the original manuscript and then when the scribes hand copy every single thing, if you cannot read something, if a scribe cannot read something, let's say it is uh, faded out, you can't read it. Or if you, the, they wrote something and you can't, you know how when you read someone else's handwriting, sometimes you can't make out of what they're reading? And sometimes you read your own handwriting and you don't know what you wrote, right? <laughs> that happens. But if you can see, they have done a really good job. They didn't really write like really poor job. They did their best to write really legibly, really clearly. However, there are still sometimes that you can't make sense out of it. Or sometimes the scribe's grammar is not so good and they would misspell something in certain ways. But a lot of times when you read misspelling, can you catch it? Can you read the right meaning of what it means? Yes, that's what happened. So a lot of times those are just minor spelling mistakes and, and so on. However, if there is something that they cannot understand, scribes, do you think scribes will just take out the whole word or add something to explain? You know what, this looks like V, but this should be U. You know, this should be this word instead of this word. They will add something there. And when that happens, somebody else will come along, maybe a, a decade later, 50 years later, they will try to copy the same manuscript, and they don't really understand what that means, and they will just add more, add more. So the later the manuscript, the longer it is. They never take things out. They keep adding more stuff. So the later manuscript will have naturally will have more. So meaning, if you look at two different manuscripts and if you cannot date them, which one do you think will be earlier, more original? Shorter manuscript or the longer manuscript? Let me ask that one more time. If you have two different manuscripts and you cannot date them for sure, which one is closer to original? Shorter manuscript or the longer manuscript? Shorter, because scribes tend to add more things than take it out. Because the Bible says, if you take anything out, I'll remove your name from the kingdom of God. If you add something, I'll add more things. 
but they were scared that if they take something out, then they are doing a terrible thing. You can't take the word of God out. So they would add more explanation to explain, this is what I read, but this, this should be this, and blah, blah, blah. So there are more things. Or sometimes what happens is that... Um, oh, okay, so I'll explain that later. But here is something that's happening. Uh, these are the pictures of uh, um, Codex Sinaiticus. So this is what I wanted to show you. Now, if you scroll through online, like Facebook or, or uh, Pinterest or, or TikTok, have you seen memes like this? So many times you will see, King James Version Bible has these, these, these verses, but newer versions skip that altogether. I mean, how can some Bibles skip some and say, like, take away the names of God and, and praising God. And it's take, all of them are taken out. Therefore, all those Bibles are rubbish. King James, Virgin, King James Virgin Bible is the only authoritative Bible. Have you seen memes like that? I mean, I understand how people are trying to uh, preserve the Word of God, and having more is better. That's what people think. But this is a misconception. Why? Because King James Version Bible was printed at what year? 1611, based on TR, which is from the manuscript from dating from 12th century to the 15th century. Whereas in the newer translation from Revised English Version to like NIV and other Bible verses, uh, Bible versions, are based on the newer discoveries of the older manuscripts dating all the way back to the 300 AD. So they are more original. However, when you go and find the verses, some of the verses are not there. So what do you do? The original one, closer to the original manuscripts, don't have some verses, or they don't have some words, so they take them out. And because of the Bible has the chapter and the verse system, you don't want to mess that up, so you just leave the verse there, and then it's just blank. So when you read the Bible, and sometimes the verse is missing, it's not because there are some Jesuit people that went and wanted to destroy and take out some things from the Bible and, and um, give wrong message so that people will not be saved. It's not that. It's because they have discovered, now we have discovered more manuscripts that are dating much uh, earlier on um, manuscripts, and the, the evidences show that's why. Okay, so please understand that's, that's what it means. Okay? So that's what doxology means. And in the same way, Matthew 6.13, doxology part, is not there in the Codex Sinaiticus or Codex Vaticanus. It's in the TR, but it's not in the earlier or the, the more original manuscripts. That's why it's not there. But then, now we come to the question, why would people add something like this at the end of the Lord's Prayer? Why would it be added? That's the question that we want to ask. So the part that we, that we are looking at is doxology, giving glory to God. And the Bible, as I said earlier, is full of those uh, examples of doxology. Okay, so here are some examples. Uh, it's from Revelation 1.6. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and he has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So, doxology, I looked up the words... Um, kingdom, power, uh, forever. No, uh, kingdom and the power uh, forever. That's, those are the words that I looked up. And there are so many different searches, search results that you can find from the Bible. And these words, oh, yeah. So kingdom, power, glory, forever. So those four words that I looked up. So this is one example. And the second one is this. From the Old Testament, First Chronicles 29 11. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted 
as head over all. So all these verses are giving praises to God. We read it as the Bible verse. But you know what? This is doxology. What does that mean? We talked about the definition of what doxology meant. This means after giving a praise or after reading the Bible, everyone will chant or sing together. That's what that means. Okay, the next one. 2 Timothy 4, 18. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. This is, so 2 Timothy 4, 18 is the very, very last verse, except for the, the greeting part, of Paul's writing. What was Paul's very last book that he wrote? 2 Timothy is Paul's very last book that he wrote. So this is the very last part that he is saying before he concludes all of his writings and says, to him be glory forever and ever. So he said the doxology part as well. And um, this is from uh, Jude chapter 1. There's only one chapter. Verses 24 and 25. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. They all sound very similar because they include the same key point of giving God glory, power, dominion forever. Those are old. So Bible has so many. I mean, just it goes on and on and on. Okay? So when people memorize the scripture, because that's what they did before, when they will get together, they're memorized. And you know what? At home, can you read the Bible on your own? Do you read the Bible at home? Do you read your Bible on your phone? Right. Right? That's what we do. And we can have access to the Bible anytime we want, everywhere we want, anywhere, anytime. But was that the case a thousand years ago? Three thousand years ago? Five thousand years ago? No. There were no printed Bibles available. So when, what they could do in the Old Testament times, before writing was available, they only would recite. Like Adam would tell the stories to his children, his descendants, this is what God told me. This is what happened. This is what, what had happened. This is a story and so on. And people would hear the stories from, handed down from their forefathers and then to their children. They would tell them the stories. That's how the oral Bible has been handed down. And after the writing was available, they would write some things, but the scrolls were so precious and so valuable and difficult to produce, they were only able to have one copy of maybe a piece of Isaiah or a piece of, of Deuteronomy, one in, one in in one synagogue. They didn't have all the Bibles that they wanted, right? So if you want to read, uh, let's say, uh, from, from uh, Judges, can you just go and find the book of Judges and read? No. When can you read the Bible? Never. You cannot read the Bible. When can you hear the Word of God being read? On Sabbath, when you go to church or the synagogue at that time. And then the rabbi would open up the scroll and would read a portion and they would actually spend quite a lot of time reading because that's the only chance they can read the Bible. So the worship style is different. We you know, come and sing praise, like not right now, but we usually sing praise and we have worship talk for like 30 minutes and then so on and so forth. Back then, reading the scripture was the majority part of, of, the, of the sermon. That's the only chance they get. So when they read something, then they would chant something together from their memory. So... Would it be possible when something was read and they would recite the chant and of doxology repeatedly, if you do that for all your life, do you think it's easy for you to add something or mix up something? Yeah, what happens when we play the song, na, 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 what do you do? What does your mind do? Is it time to go out and exit the building? 
Is it time to come and pay the offering? No. What, what, what are you supposed to do when you hear the music at our church? Na, 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 na. The time of prayer, right? So exact same thing happened. When something happens, people all chant something together. But you know what? A lot of times people mix, mix up. Like, uh, I mean, can you think of a hymn that everybody sings together, you've been singing all your life, but then you, everybody says it wrong. They say the word wrong or the tune wrong. It's, it's not coming to my head, like one example. But like, I'm sure there are so many different times that we sing something wrong, but we've been doing it all our lives. Right? That's what happened to the Lord's Prayer. After the Lord's Prayer was over, people would just naturally just sing doxology all together, and they wanted to praise God. That's probably what happened to this part. It was added later on. Okay, now, when you think about this song, this, um, this prayer, doxology actually means giving God glory, honor, praise, sing forever. So that should be our prayer too. Every time we pray, who should be praised? It's not me, it's not us. The focus of the prayer is not me. It's not about how great I am or how, how something. It's about how thankful I am because God has blessed me. How, how awesome day I had because He has helped me. He had provided for me. And, or maybe I'm going through so much trouble, but I'm still trusting God because He has promised. Because He is, has promised that He will see me through. He has promised that He would carry me through. That is the focus of our prayer. And that is exactly what this prayer is saying, giving God glory and honor. Do you want to give God praise, honor, dominion, and, and say that his, his reign is forever, God is forever? Do you want to say that? That should be our prayer. And that is what is added to the Lord's prayer. And I believe that is been, has been added with a purpose and a meaning. They ha their lives, people who have uh, written the Bible, their lives were full of giving glory and honor to God. And that's why it is added. And I believe that we sh our lives should be the same. Our lives should be filled with giving glory to God, giving praises to God, that God who is worthy of our praise. So in this closing song, um, I'll be playing a, a song of uh, Rima uh, Marvain. Rima Marvain is a seven-year-old girl who sang this song beautifully. And I want to play this song, The Lord's Prayer. But before we do that, our offering, Tizen offering today, is the Conference-Wide Church and School Building Fund. So for your Tizen offering, you can either pay your tithes and offering on the way out, exit here. There is an offering plate you can offer, or you can just do it online as you've done so in the past. You can do that, but just so you know, that loose offering that we give will be going to the conference-wide church and the school building fund. Let us have a prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we give our praise to you. Lord, you have preserved the Bible for us so that we can read the Bible and we have access to the Word of God anywhere, anytime. But Lord, how often have we neglected reading the Bible? How many times have we just brushed aside and we have spent time in doing something else? And Lord, people in the back, uh, in the olden days, they didn't have the Bible, they didn't have this Word of God in their hand, but they treasured it so much. Lord, we pray that you will help us to treasure the Word of God and help us to have our lives be filled with giving glory and honor to you. Just like this song, Doxology, is saying, giving glory to God. Help our lives to be filled with you. And we pray for this offering that we give to you. May this offering be used to further your kingdom. May you bless the hands that give this offering to you today. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and um, forgive 
us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and glory forever and ever. Amen. May our hearts also be filled with the Lord's Prayer, just like this girl was singing. And may we meditate upon the Lord's Prayer. You don't know how happy I am to see all of you here. I'm, I'm like really about to cry to see um, your faces here to worship with us. And also people who are watching us online, I invite you to come join us next week and the following week because we can open now. So happy as you spend this Sabbath, May you meditate upon the Word of God and may you spend this time to pray uh, with your family and with your loved ones. Have a happy Sabbath. We'll see you next week. <laughs>